Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this exciting webinar. Let's give some more time for everyone to join. So feel free to grab your tea, coffee, and a notepad, and we will start shortly. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I see people are still joining and um, and we will start shortly. So let's allow them to, to join us and grab your drinks and snacks and let's start in a bit. Hello everyone. Hi Richard, I see Sotiris. Hi Jack, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at this insightful webinar. Let's give some more time for others to join as well and we will start shortly. Hello everyone, just a last reminder. Um, let's let's tr give a couple of uh, seconds more for others to join and we will start shortly. So go grab your coffees and teas and get your notepads ready as we're starting in a bit. Hello, everyone. I think we can slowly, slowly start. I see already some nice comments and, and feedback. It is indeed great to have this live session. It is great to have you all joining us. And um, I'm happy to share this virtual stage with, with you. And today I'm also joined by Joan from DevExperts, Chris from uh, uh, FTSC, and AB from Phoenixed. And uh, my name is Elisa. I am event content and speaker manager at Finance Magnets. And as I said before, I'm very happy you are joining us today at this insightful webinar, how to start your own FX brokerage. I think without further ado, we should also start and everyone else who will be joining, I think um, they will be just joining us. And without uh, further ado, I will just remind a couple of house rules. Um, please, please, please keep yourselves muted at all times during this session. Uh, this session will be recorded, so afterwards you will have the chance to either find it on, uh, on demand or on our YouTube channel, Finance Magnet YouTube channel. You will also receive a follow-up um, from our side, so don't worry. And the most important feel free to share any questions you might have during this session, as at the end, if the time will allow, we will also go through them and try to answer as much as possible uh, at the end of this session. Um, yeah, I think we should go get going and get to the topic, but before that, I would really like to uh, allow our speakers to introduce themselves. And um, John, I think let's start with you. Just briefly, who you are, who you are representing, what you are doing. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. My name's John Light. I'm head of OTC product at DevExperts, and we build trading platforms for brokers and exchanges. It's our 20th year uh, in operation, and we're over 850 people. And our platforms uh, go across all asset classes, FX, CFD, crypto, stocks, futures, options, and they can start from a SaaS offering where we can give brokers a platform out of the box through to enterprise, through to source code license. Thank you, John. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Rowe. I'm a director of Financial Technology Consultancy Services Limited. My company was set up at the beginning of 2020 to help brokerages find the right technology and services for their businesses. 
Uh, I work across all sectors of the industry from compliance through trading technologies and blockchain to payments, banking and everything in between. I also offer a consultancy service to startup brokers, helping them plan their new businesses and to help them source the correct technologies and services in order to run a successful brokerage. I have a background in trading technology and prior to that in voice and data networks. Thank you, Chris. Abby? Hello, everyone. I'm Abby, founder of Finnext. We are a Singapore-based fintech providing a low-code platform for multi-asset brokers, banks, and for other financial institutions as well. As for FX brokers in context, once the broker has sorted their regulatory aspects and finalized their trading platforms, we help them set up the rest of the tech stack within a few days, right from digital onboarding, KYC, AML, client portals, PSP integration, CRMs, IB management, and including other aspects and ancillary services like fund management, copy trading, et cetera. So we provide these services not just on SaaS, but also on on-premise, depending on the business requirement. I am really excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks everyone for joining in. Thank you so much. I think let's not wait any longer and let's just dive deep into the topic. Um, so let's start from the very beginning. Um, when a startup broker is planning their new business, what should they be doing and in what order? Perhaps let's start with Chris. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's an interesting question, this one. Um, I think for me, the key thing to identify is the market you're looking to approach. Um, if you're not sure of exactly what you're looking to offer, that <coughs> really has, has to be your, your primary objective to begin with. Um, once you've done that and you've worked out what asset classes you want to trade, um, where you know geographically you want to locate and where your customer base is going to be, um, you then need to start looking at things like regulation. I'm sure we'll cover regulation in a bit more detail later. Um, it, uh, it can be a bit of a minefield. It is continuously changing as well, which makes it very difficult to, um, to advise on. Um, but I, you know, I personally work with compliance specialists who are very good at and knowledgeable at, at the, the regulation side. Um, I would then say uh, creating a, a five-year business plan um, is, is actually quite key. A lot of brokers, when they start, they just look at the immediate situation they're in and how do I get going? But the reality, you know, if I take something like regulation, um, the reality is you may actually want an initial regulation and you may want to have another regulation, you know, a, a, a slightly, um, I was going to say upmarket regulation, but, a, you know, one of the SISEC, ASEC, FCA type regulations, you might not want to do that from day one, but that might be a consider consideration later on. And it's just planning at that. Um, and then the other thing is really getting the budget sorted. Uh, virtually everybody I've spoken to about planning a brokerage hasn't really considered all the budget uh, considerations you need, like what staff you're going to require, what services you're going to need to, to cover. So hopefully people will find this uh, uh, interaction very interesting because it should open their eyes to, to some of the things they need to be thinking about. Great. Um, Amy, would you like to add something on this? Thanks. Uh, I think Chris has pretty nicely uh, just mentioned all, all the order, I would say. But just to summarize or paraphrase what he has said, right? From my perspective, it's, it's simple. First, there has to be a plan in terms of the target addressable market, but it's going to be focused in Asia, it's going to be focused in UAE, wherever, and, and obviously with the go to market strategy for it, right? After you get all the regulatory requirements, you have to focus on the tech stack that has to be set up build the customer support before you start the sales and marketing. That's when you start scaling the market, uh, sales and marketing. But as part of our experience working with a lot of startup brokers, uh, I would really say that be mindful or cognizant of the lead time that's required right from acquiring licenses to different jurisdictions to launch, uh, to launch obviously the tech integration time that is required, hiring staff that is required, and even simple things like payment gateways. You know, at times we've seen it take months for the broker to uh, uh, have delay in their entire plan and factor in these with some buffer and surprises for delays in the in your plan. Uh, I'm sure that in the rest of the session, there are all these aspects that you've just mentioned. We'll dwell deeper and try to explain and share our experience in this as well. Great, thank you so much. So so far we have covered market, budget, business plan, regulations. John, would you like to add something on these aspects? Um, yes, yeah, so. I, I, 
along similar kind of lines, it's understandable that a startup wants to get up and running as quickly as they can. So they need to do as much in parallel as, as possible. Um, and they should start with the things that take longer to sort out, like Chris mentioned, regulation and other, other areas that could become blockers, like Amy mentioned, payment, payment gateways. But firstly, the brokers really need to decide on the business type and the model that they want to achieve. They, need, they should know the client segment that they're trying to attract and what will be the most common client profile, and then figure out what they need to serve these type of clients. And this should drive the events and define what the broker needs to do. Uh, where will the clients be? Will they be new traders or experienced traders? Will the broker need to concentrate on a mobile offering? And we're seeing with the new generation and going into emerging regions, uh, a seamless mobile offering is the only option to attract these type of traders. Um, will they want to attract more experienced traders who need a sophisticated terminal with charting? Um, and all of this will drive the regulatory compliance and legal decisions um, as to target a certain client profile, different licenses are needed uh, in different locations. Um, and you can even have different license considerations uh, between retail and professional uh, traders, for example. Um, so what is important for this client segment? What do they expect to trade? Uh, what will get them to sign up? You can't just uh, offer FX trading anymore. You need to offer multi-asset. You need, like most clients will expect to be able to trade US stocks and crypto as a minimum. Um, so all of this helps drive the regulatory and technology decisions that, that will come. Great, right. thank you, John. Perhaps you would also like to continue on the next question. So what does this broker's ecosystem look like? I think you already started uh, the conversation on that. And uh, what is the bare minimum brokers need to have in order to be operational? Yeah, so in my, in my mind, um, the ecosystem is driven by two key areas. Firstly, uh, sales slash marketing, and secondly, operations slash dealing. And these areas in turn drive the platforms that are needed and the rest of the ecosystem plugs around all of these. So central to marketing and sales is the CRM or the portal or the client cabinet. It's got lots of different names, <laughs> but brokers need to have a website that feeds into it. They need to have uh, IB and affiliate management. They need to automate their client onboarding. Uh, they need to have KY, somewhere for KYC and AML checks and then to be able to allow clients to deposit and withdraw their funds. And then the marketing campaign feeds into this area as well, and it's also used for managing sales. And then the second area, operations and dealing, this, is, uh, this function is central to the trading platform. So this includes the traders terminals uh, for, for execution, web or mobile or APIs, the tools for the broker to run their brokerage, configuring A and B book management, pricing, commissions, markups, spreads, et cetera. Um, and it, at its simplest level, on top of the trading platform, all brokers really need is an LP or a, a price feed. And other things can be done manually, but it won't be very sustainable. Um, things like regulatory reporting, you could do it manually, but when you get larger, it, it, it becomes much harder. So it's really important to be able to plug in all of these other services and platforms. Um, and the other parts of the ecosystem is really driven by these first two areas. So things like IT and client services, it really depends on the decisions made around the CRM and the trading platform. For example, the less automation, the more client services you're going to need. Great, thank you so much. Very interesting points. Um, AB, what would you add on this? Um... I think uh, John covered almost all the points, but just to add on uh, and re-emphasize, a lot of the decision of what exactly is required in the ecosystem would depend on the strategy and the management priorities, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, we deal with a lot of startup brokers in Japan. They're very clear with the focus. They're focused with fund management as a centric strategy that they have. Some are focused with IB as a centric strategy. So depending on the strategy that they have, everything else is going to add on to it. Uh, obviously, risk management uh, tops the chart in terms of irrespective of what strategy they start as as long as the bro as long as the brokerage. In light of uh, the recent changes in the industry, especially from a trading platform perspective, 
making sure you're partnering with the right uh, vendor and having the right diversification required is in place as well. And like John mentioned, getting the right client portal, client journey is critical because the ease of use is what is going to drive uh, client acquisition and every other investment in terms of sales and marketing is all about conversion. So making sure that you have the right channels inside is going to help. And I'll conclude my answer very technology focused, right? I'll conclude that tech is going to be an enabler. You have to partner with the vendors with strong customer-centric focus, especially when you're starting up, you need somebody who is hand-holding you in the initial teething issues due to internal no lack of knowledge and integrations, et cetera. Like everything in, uh, in life as we start the journey, so you should select strong partners uh, to work together with you. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, there have been so many aspects already mentioned, <laughs> but I do believe that there is- I still got stuff to talk episode. about. Yeah, don't worry, I've still got stuff to talk about. So I think, um, I mean, following on from John's comments, to me, the, sort of the two important aspects of uh, what the client sees, so the, the end customer, are very much the platform. Um, and, you know, we, we include within that sort of mobile apps, et cetera, um, uh, any sort of social trading things they may require, et cetera. Um, and the other side is really the website and branding. Um, Sometimes that sort of almost comes across as a bit of an afterthought. And actually, the branding is key. I mean, you know, the big guys like eToro and IG Markets and CMC will spend an absolute fortune on making sure the branding is superb. Um, it's not something to be sniffed at. It is the first point of contact for a lot of clients. Um, I think the answer to that, you know, what the ecosystem looks like really varies depending on which route the clients take, uh, the, the, the broker's taking, because you know, there is the white label offering um, where they have a lot less control, um, but it's a, it's a cheap and easy way of, of entering into the market, um, although that's increasingly becoming more difficult. Um, and then there's obviously the full platform setup, which is a, a, is a much slower process in terms of getting to market, but it is one that you have a lot more control over um, and you can work from there. So... You know, I think it depends on the brokerage, what they want to do. Um, what they do need to think about is it's very simple to go, oh, I'll just go white label. But this is where the five year plan that I talk about comes in, because if you go white label, what's going to happen in two years time when you're big enough and ugly enough and want to move on to your own ecosystem? How easy is it going to be? How disruptive is it going to be for your clients in terms of their journey? Um, and all of that needs to be considered. But I think, you know, everything that both EB and John have mentioned, I, I agree with. I mean, EB was talking about using technology. Um, when you're a startup broker, you've got one of two options. Use technology or get an awful lot of staffing. Um, and getting a lot of staffing can be an extremely expensive and painful way of doing it when technology exists out there. So. Um, I do agree with Eby that, you know, use technology wherever you can to automate processes um, to make your life easier. And here, um, again, we have covered so many of these important aspects already. Um, market, budget, mm -hmm. business plan, regulations, technology, obviously. Um, however, are there still any of these important aspects, important things that uh, starting a broker uh, should keep in mind? Chris, there, is there something left that we haven't mentioned? <laughs> well, of course, of course, as, as, as a consultant, um, I think you've got to use the resources out there. I mean, you know, I've, I've got a business helping people find technology. Um, these companies, yeah, you know, I'm working with some very ex, ex, uh, successful and large um, brokers and I'm still helping them find technology they don't really know exists um, I think getting advice um, you know that's why I set my business up was to help brokerages find the right solutions for what they need um, especially around you know EB's point of automation etc there's an awful lot of products that will help you um, and you know EB mentioned earlier about the fact that you don't wouldn't necessarily need to start with a CRM but you will need one fairly soon. Um, the reality is if you don't start with one, then try and go to one. It, it, it's actually, I'm sure you'll confirm this, is quite technically difficult and can cause you a lot of problems. So it, it's all these sort of ideas, getting advice. It, people who come into 
uh, owning a brokerage or starting a brokerage will come either from a dealing desk respect, in which case they might not be aware of what's required on marketing and sales side. They may come from a sales um, side, in which case great, but then they're not really going to be uh, totally up to speed with the technology. So get advice wherever you can. Um, talk to a lot of people, get their opinions. Everybody that you're talking to in the industry has set up and gone through the same process. Hmm. Um, so, right. you know, they, they there's a lot of people who will give you advice. Not all of it's going to be good. Um, hmm. I will say that. Um, or not necessarily good, but it, it might not be relevant to what you're doing. You know, it's quite different setting up a brokerage 10 years ago than it is now. Hmm. Um, but, you know, if you can take the detail out of that, um, it would be a real help. Great. Um, John, I will just throw the discussion towards your direction now. Um, Is there something you would like to add on this? Yeah, I think the one most important thing is having the capability to be flexible. For example, you, you don't want to be stuck only um, having uh, one particular asset class that you're offering or only able to use one single liquidity source. Um, but it's tough because startups, they really want to be flexible. They really is uh, speed to market is really important, but these things kind of contradict. You know, they want to sign with providers that can offer everything because every extra vendor creates more time and cost with legal and, and onboarding. But by doing this, they need to make sure they don't get locked in a particular offering. And we've seen this with established brokers that want to move to different markets, um, brokers with a retail platform, and then wanting to offer a B2B offering. You know, they already have the platforms and the tools, the teams and the processes around their retail way, way of working. Um, so unless they can modify their existing platform, it really means adding another platform to be able to offer that, that kind of offering. Um, and then finally, um, uh, it's, it's not new, but mobile continues to dominate clients' uh, main requirements. And you know, it's really important. And the recent industry news uh, merely prioritizes this even more. You, know, you can't be reliant on shared apps and the reputation of other brokers. Um, certainly now that uh, big tech like Apple and, and Google is, is, has the power to decide the fate to, of a broker's offering. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we already covered uh, or at least started talking uh, about this uh, previously, which is very important topic is the regulation and the regulatory part of uh, when starting uh, brokerage. Um, this is one of the most important areas and uh, perhaps Chris, I will address this question to you. What does a startup need to consider when deciding on their license type and where is the best for them to be regulated? What would yeah, be absolutely. your suggestion? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think the uh, really the key areas to this, um, there's sort of two key areas which will define where you should get regulated and one is identifying where your market is who are you targeting where are the growth markets um and the other is to look at the asset classes john's already hit on the on the fact that when you're choosing platform technology etc or any other liquidity etc you need to be looking at true multi-asset one of the issues with our industry is it moves so quickly it's why i find it so exciting and interesting to be in um, you know, come from a telecom background where it's fundamentally the same as it was 20 years ago and you can have a, a week's holiday and come back and it's all different in the FX uh, and brokerage space. Um, but I think if you can identify where you want to sell to, um, that will influence where you need to get regulated. Um, asset class as well, uh, you know, if you, if you know your marketplace, you'll know what they want to trade. Uh, and then you can come up with what you want to offer. And it, once again, it might be a staggered approach. You might go, well, I want to start with FX and CFDs and commodities. Um, but, you know, within a year or two years, I want to be doing single stock equities. I want to be doing actual cryptos rather than cryptos as a CFD, et cetera. Now, the things that are going to influence um, where you should look to get regulated, um, capital is one of them. Uh, if you look at the FCA, um, they are you know it's a great regulation to have but it typically takes nine to 12 months to get regulated you will need a compliance um, specialist to help you and you'll probably need to employ a compliance officer at the same time you are almost certainly going to require an office um, so all of this will add cost and time to you but you know all of that is minimal compared to the capital requirements if you want to be able to manage risk under an fca license 
Um, other licenses are changing. You know, I've heard recently that Mauritius now requires feet on the street. Um, they want people located in Mauritius. They don't want a London brokerage or a Cytec, bro uh, not Cytec, but a Cyprus-based brokerage, you know, creating an offshore license in Mauritius without anybody there. Even places like Vanuatu are now doing it. Um, I think quite a lot of people um, look at a sort of short-term picture and a long-term picture. I've certainly worked with, um, with, with brokerages that have started with a, an offshore license, which is easier to get hold of, and then worked on you know, one of the big three of the FCA, SISEC or ASIC, which requires more capital, takes more time, et cetera. Um, also, do you need to take risk initially? Are you gonna manage uh, a B book? Um, once again, if you're not, it's much quicker to get to market, and at least you can then start getting revenues in before you then start looking at jurisdictions to do B booking in. And there's all sorts of new things coming up. I mean, in the last month, I've heard of sandwich FX and crypto licenses, which I hadn't come across before. So there are certain um, jurisdictions where you can get a combined FX and crypto license, um, and even crypto spread betting. Um, I mean, spread betting is quite a big thing in the UK. Um, it's tax free in the UK, but it can only be offered to professional traders. But, you know, these are the sort of things that are happening the whole time. And in a year, a year is a long time in, in what is required in uh, regulation. I hope that sort of covers everything. But uh... yeah, it was very insightful. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive uh, answer on, on this. Um, regulation is indeed uh, a huge and important aspect, uh, but nevertheless, also technology is another of uh, important aspects. And as we already have sort of touched the base on that, as AB said, that tech is an, an, an enabler. And, um, and we definitely, that's the part that the user sees first. Um, so perhaps let's have a look like when brokers uh, when you when we look at brokers offerings they usually correct me if i'm wrong they usually look quite similar if not the same um but let's see how can brokers differentiate themselves when these offerings are so similar uh, and i would like to start with ab here what would be the enabler there <laughs> <laughs> thanks elisa i think we've been fortunate or unfortunate to get a lot of customers or startup brokers and we have seen uh, customers who have become successful or brokers who have become successful and quite a few of them who have gone belly up as well, especially in a fast growing and a crowded retail brokerage market. I think the high level of competition cannot be ignored. Uh, unfortunately, some of the brokers, instead of focusing on actual client and market needs, try to promote themselves with a variety of you know, super attractive and unrealistic promises, huge bonuses, high leverage, free accounts, etc. But in order to be successful in this market, Brokers have to face and overcome some and several challenges and focus on a few which we have seen successfully work for startup brokers in particular. So you cannot compete with a CMC and IG in terms of the amount of money that can, they, they can throw in terms of client acquisition, but you can provide a much better uh, co and competitive customer service, managing clients' expectations, stay in touch with the clients, knowledge, uh, share the knowledge of the market, make sure you're available, especially in terms of uh, pro conducting regular training sessions, whether it's product, whether it is market, et cetera. And you should always try to tech up because once you're, when you're a startup, you're leaner, it's easier for you to make decisions and pivot. So brokers have to continuously be in tune with the different products in the market offered, especially by, the, by other brokers, and also be up to date with the latest technology. The focus on tech has to be to provide optimal experience and what we've realized is not just for your end client but also for your operations because as optimal as your operations is at that better service you would be able to provide to your end customers as well so tech integration i i consider it as like house renovation you can always do more <laughs> idea but don't try to boil the ocean uh, keep improvising as you grow um, second part is uh, marketing and branding i think chris touched on it by far one of the most important things you have to select the right tools to do your marketing don't use aggressive marketing with extraordinary promises follow market regulations obviously and ensure you find the client needs uh, last but by, by far uh, the most important according to me is risk management especially when you're a startup with traders becoming more sophisticated brokers need to have a robust risk management system as well 
Great, thank you. I saw Joan was nodding during uh, your answers. Joan, would you like to add something on, on what Ebby yeah, said? Um, there was so, some overlap, so I won't, I won't um, go through some, some pieces, but uh, from a technology standpoint, I, I, I believe that there are two ways to create a USP. Um, either you have a platform that can be customized, or you have a platform that has all of the APIs around it and you can plug in different third parties to, to make a, an offering. Uh, and platforms that can be customized, this could either be uh, bringing you the development in-house for you to, to, to change things or having a vendor that can really make you something unique. And this can give you unlimited uh, flexibility and it can uh, make the platform your own, but it's obviously, it can be expensive and can take time. Um, and at least if you can customize on top of an existing platform, you're only developing a small percentage of what you need uh, and the building blocks are already there. The second option I mentioned, having a flexible platform with APIs. Uh, these APIs need to support everything from back office management, trading through to front end, in, front end changes. Uh, and then using third parties like uh, Finex or you know, uh, other, other companies out there um, put together something that's really unique. And there are a lot of great companies offering specific solutions for brokers. So you can plug them in together and it's, it's much cheaper than building something from scratch. Um, you might not have a seam seamless experience in some place, but um, you know, uh, that, that's, uh, it's much quicker and cheaper to get something to market. But I think by far the best way um, to create a unique offering is to be able to do both of these. So having a platform that could be customized and having a platform that has the APIs around it. So for example, our platform, um, we've had clients take it out of the box and run successful retail and in institutional brokerages all the way through to uh, crypto brokers, all the way through to a CFTC regulated set uh, with complex options and complex workflows. And this last example um, was a combination, you know, maybe we had 70% uh, of what was needed out of the box. We customized 15% and 15% came from third parties that they plugged into. So I would really say um, having that gives you the, the, the most flexibility to make something that really is unique. Great. Thank you. Good. Very great points. We will definitely come back to those. Chris, uh, is there anything else you would like to add uh, how to differentiate? Yeah, I'm, um, I want to follow on from John's point, actually, because I think, you know, there are a number of areas and the starting point for me is platform. Um, I've seen in the last 10 years that there's been very much a we need to offer the same as everybody else. Um, second half of this year, that trend is changing. And I would imagine in the next 24 months, we're going to see significant changes in how the market views that. Um, the problem with copying everybody else is it is a race to the bottom. If you're doing exactly the same as everyone else, then the only thing that's going to differentiate you is pricing. Um, you know, so it's going to be the spread on what you're offering, et cetera, because you're not offering anything unique. I can go and get it from anywhere. Um, I think with what's happened with, for example, Apple, um, deciding they want to act as a bit of a, <laughs> a, a regulator themselves. Um, I think a lot of people are now going, well, actually, what I really want is to have my own bespoke technology. You know, everybody in an ideal world will want something like IG's proprietary platform. Uh, the problem is they haven't got 600 developers doing it. And, uh, you know, um, but there are off the shelf solutions that you can buy that look like your platform um you know as far as anybody else is concerned is your platform but they're off the shelf and quite cost effective so i think platforms one of the areas i would start um i think the way you're interacting with brokers is a big thing nowadays uh eb's obviously down in singapore southeast asia they're all on the mobiles if it can't be done on the mobiles they're all using messaging apps each country has a different messaging app they favor you know it might be wechat or line or telegram so having ways that you can communicate with people on those apps is quite key um so people can go to your website go well i'm i use telegram so i'm just going to click on the telegram icon and start talking to someone at the brokerage ease of onboarding um it's probably my next pet subject. Um, I think brokers severely underestimate the importance of this. Um, chatting to traders, when they decide they're going to open an account, they don't go to one broker and go, I'm going to do the account opening process. They might do two, they might do three. 
whoever goes yes first is the one they'll fund. Um, so you spend a lot of money on marketing and advertising to try and get that broker to come and talk to you. And then you fall down because you've got a slow onboarding process. Your KYC is taking too long. It's not automated in the correct way. Um, website is the first place that people will look. It's the first thing that they see um, when you know they're contacting a broker. Um, I'm a very suspicious person by nature. I don't buy anything online unless I can see where they're based and it's got a contact telephone number. I am staggered how many bro you know, brokers you go on their website. I couldn't tell you what country they're based in. Um, you know, the only thing for contact is a contact form. Um, and then there's a heading at the top saying 75% of CFD brokers are losing, you know, clients lose their money. You would, yeah, make it easy. Uh, yeah, we look at people like IG, they have a big help desk. This is what you need. You need to be able to interact quickly and easily with your clients that they feel at ease to go and deposit money and work with you. I think the offering, we've, we've covered a bit of that. Um, John's been talking about multi-asset. And actually, to, to add on this, uh, I think both of you already mentioned uh, about building and buying and what yeah. would be the best um, on that. So perhaps we could just continue the conversation in this uh, from this angle. And uh, perhaps I would like to ask John on this, um, what would be the best way then to build or to buy? Um, I think in FX, because of the complexity and the number of different providers and the number of different models, it's not as simple as uh, build versus buy for startups. Uh, and there are a lot more options and combinations. So I define them as in, in four different areas. You've got uh, your white label, you've got your turnkey solution, you've got buy or, or license, and you've got build. So white label, this is where you as a broker get added to an, an existing broker's platform. You get a branded UI and some tools for managing your clients. It's really quick to get set up and running. It's cheap. You don't really need to do, do too much, but you and your clients are 100% reliant on that broker running the platform. So it's great for getting started, but it's gonna be really hard once you progress and your, your business is established. The second one being turnkey. So this is where a single vendor gives you everything in a full package. So the trading platform, the CRM, the liquidity, even websites. Again, it's really quick. You only need to sign with one vendor and it's great if it meets your needs, but uh, you're not gonna be able to change things in the future. Chris mentioned the five-year plan. You know, um, with a turnkey, it's going to be very hard for you to swap or add another liquidity provider because that's kind of how they, those guys are making their, their money. Um, so it's only good for that, that uh, specific business model, and you don't know how things are going to change over time. The third one, uh, which is buy or license, this is uh, where a broker takes a platform off the shelf, plugs in third parties that they want to use. Um, they'll have to integrate and contract with different vendors. It takes a bit longer, but the broker has a lot more control. Uh, and then the final one is build. Uh, for a startup broker, it's not going to make much sense. So, you know, where they're going to build something com completely from scratch and, and uh, it's very complex. Uh, it really requires a specialist team and experienced uh, developers. It would take many years, and, and unless the broker is not in a rush or has got a lot of capital or really need something really unique, it's not an option for most. So I'd say the best solution is to uh, license a platform, plug in third parties, but then have the option to build later on. But as a startup, it can be really difficult to overcome the initial attraction of a white label or a turnkey solution. Um, but startups just need to understand how that could hinder themselves in the future. Thank you, John. Uh, Abby, again, would you like to add something on this very complete answer? <laughs> sure. I think I have a slightly stronger opinion on this. I think the build and buy software debate has been going on long enough, right? That's it. And it is time that we settled in. Uh, to better understand, let us take down the history lane, like they say. During the Industrial Revolution, the economy of Europe was flourishing. Due to this, companies started hiring third parties and take work offload uh, to offload off their shoulders. Hence began the era of outsourcing, which was has changed the face over time to a point where companies can now buy ready-made solutions. Buying reduces the cost of production and complexities, right? Of the tasks that cannot be performed in-house due to either lack of resources, expertise, or infrastructure. It ensures that the organizations can actually focus on their core activities and mitigate the risks that they have. 
on the other end of the spectrum of course critics say buying software damages the company's reputation in some cases restrict potential to be unique so the best option is to build house uh, build it in house as uh, build the software in house right but obviously there are pros and cons all i would say is you know you should choose your battles right especially at the stage where we where you are in everything can be built in house from a technology perspective in particular right but you should have a strong business reason to justify the cost not to build you know, but to main, not only to build but to maintain it and keep it up to speed with the market and the resources that is required and the returns that you will get with them uh, are meeting the business needs and the business goals that you have right i i think in one of the uh, panel discussions in ifx expo london recently i think the one of the heads of xness mentioned that as you grow once you are to a certain level it absolutely makes sense for you to in house a lot of the aspects to make sure that you are in full control but when you're starting up i think you really need to choose your battles uh, and it has to be in a combination where you start for plugging with third parties and like john rightly mentioned the vendors that you're choosing at least should have an option for you to enable Uh, to have your own customization or scalability required once you reach that stage as well. Thank you, Avi. Uh, Chris, a short addition on on what yeah, has been said already. I was just going to provide an example outside the industry to sort of, I think, stress Avi's point. Uh, Volkswagen, the car manufacturer, make ten and a half million cars a year. They buy their tires from Michelin or Continental. Their fuel injection from Bosch. you know they're big enough and ugly enough they can make their own tires they can make their own fuel injection systems they don't because there are experts who do it who are experts in that field um i agree with eb i think you know unless you really are that big that you can afford to have loads of devs there doing it there is no point buy buy products off the shelf customize them to make them look like your own uh, i think that's the key thing it's it's got to look unique rather than a generic product um but it's going to be a lot more cost effective and um on the final note on that i've seen so many people where i chat them and go oh no we're building this in house and 2 years later you have the same conversation how's it going have you have you launched it yet not yet um you know and the amount of money spent and the problem is they can't unwind from that because they spent half a million pounds you've got a solution costing 20,000 pounds a year and no one wants to go to the board of directors so i've just spent 3 million on the last 6 years trying to develop a product that I could have bought off the shelf for 20,000 pounds. And speaking of money <laughs> and uh, and and being cost effective um we all and including brokers want to keep the costs down as much as possible. Um so what would be the what can brokers outsource and what must they do internally? Perhaps a couple of examples um John would you like to start yeah. Yeah, it, it really does depend on the broker. Um, they would they would have different needs. A white label broker is pretty much the outsourced all of their operations and dealing. The largest brokers will want to do everything in house. But the smaller brokers, they can make smart decisions, um, especially by outsourcing things where every broker is doing the same, and it doesn't really bring any competitive advantage or adding value to do it yourself. So. uh things like tech support comes up a lot um brokers really underestimate the cost of uh, support there mm. you know just to man it 24 hours 5 and a half days a week it's a lot of people and now you've got to man it 7 days a week um some platforms you've got to install on servers and have a big uh, infrastructure and team to manage it so outsourcing this and then i think outsourcing your dealing desk functionality to get maximum profits from the flow is probably the most interesting So certainly, if you're a smaller broker, uh, this this can add a lot of value, and we're seeing a lot of our clients doing that. Chris, would you like to add something on this? Yeah, I, th- I think com- compliance and risk functionality as well. You can automate those processes. There's no point in having a massive compliance team when there is technology that, when someone wants to join, yeah, wants to sign up, it can be automated. Risk as well. If you're a startup broker, you know, can you afford to have a load of risk managers employed to cover you 24 hours a day are they never going to go on holiday go to a wedding or funeral or anything else um the reality is that's not going to happen so having a platform that can manage your risk is good um i'm sure there's other things that eb will add in for that one but uh, i think let's uh, go yeah. to that yeah but, you know it gives you an indication of what can be done exactly yeah. thank you eb yeah sure thanks uh, 
I, th- I think it's a very sensitive topic, especially when it comes to startup brokers. You know, some cost is of uh, utmost importance. But based on again my experience that I've seen with a start a lot of startup brokers, don't always have the future in mind. If you start you know, go and buy cheaper products just to save cost, cost for example, that bites back a lot harder as you grow and scale. Right. My philosophy for outsourcing is very simple. Uh, outsource what is not your core strength. Like uh, like Chris mentioned, you're starting a brokerage with some background. You can be, have a dealing desk background or you can have a tech background or you can have some management background. Whatever is your core strength, that you technically don't need to outsource. You can make a better judgment and set up a better team. But what is not, you should try to outsource whatever can be. Like tech and customer support and uh, like uh, John mentioned, dealing desk, those are relatively easier things to outsource. But till now, I have not seen a successful sales, marketing, finance, uh, being outsourced. Uh, so that has to be in-house irrespective. So. Thank you so much. And now we are slowly uh, getting closer to the end of our uh, wonderful discussion. And um, let's just take a look at this crystal ball and uh, let's try to see what the future holds. And um, what do you think? Uh, what will be the future trends uh, we will see coming? And how will the business models of brokerage will change and uh, what the brokers are actually asking for, perhaps shortly, uh, a minute each. Um, John? Um, yes, after the, the high volumes we saw in 2020 and 2021, I think the world is tightening up <laughs> due to other costs and traders are going to have lot, uh, much more, uh, much less disposable income. So I don't think we'll see many kind of groundbreaking innovation or demands for, from the brokers. And I think brokers decisions will be based on two things that it will be about minimizing their risk and minimizing costs. So minimizing risk, such as depending on single vendors with the recent news with Apple. Um, we've got a lot of established brokers now really uh, coming to us uh, interested in the second platform where they can have much more control over things like the app stores. Uh, we're seeing brokers wanting to add as, uh, other asset classes, either into their existing platform or spinning outside businesses because it's just too risky to only have FX now and, and traders really want everything in one place. And then to reducing cost, um, things like reducing support staff. We have a lot of interest with people, um, brokers looking at, uh, at our AI bots that we can build into trading platforms. So you could have uh, an AI support uh, desk where 80% of the client queries, you know, they're, they're very similar. They can be answered by the bot and the remaining 20% goes through to a, a, a real person in the support team where there's, and, and this can give a, a big saving. So I would, I'd say those kind of areas. Great. Chris, what would it, what's your prediction? <laughs> Uh, I think individualization, we're beginning to see it happen already in the last sort of few months. Um, I think there's going to be a move away from having exactly the same as everybody else. And people are all going to now look at how do I come across as a completely different type of uh, operation or, you know, a different offering. Um, you know, people are going to be looking at things like social trading, charting, uh, front end, mobile apps, that type of thing. Anything that when a, a client looks, it goes, oh, OK, that's really good. I like that. I'm going to trade with that broker. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing. I think John's spoken on the other subject, which I think is going to happen is is the, the continued push to multi assets. Uh, you know, if you're a crypto broker, BTC has gone through the, the floor. It will only go up. Um, but, it, you know, if that's your only offering, you're you're going to be a bit limited. Um, and I think there's going to be some niche asset classes you know we've seen things like um the uh, the shares in, in the us you can now could get uh potential proportional shares i can't remember exactly what it's described as but it's uh, um, rather than just buying a full share um so that sort of trading is happening as well so i think these sort of little niches um will appear in in the asset classes great thank you so much av to conclude the prediction part. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. Uh, I think, firstly, I want to weigh in definitely in what on what John and uh, Chris both mentioned. I, I personally see that in the next five years, brokers providing only FX or CFDs or even crypto as a single asset type will be very few. Uh, diversifying to more asset types and truly value-added services is inevitable for the brokers, especially to increase both the customer retention and revenue. Right. In terms of growth, I think most of the bigger curves that you would see is definitely in the emerging markets. Southeast Asia, India, LATAM offer a vast potential for continued expansion, especially due to the 
uh, large populations and growing middle class in those emerging markets. Of course, these present you know, both opportunities and challenges for brokers, especially operating in these markets. Right On one hand, there's huge potential. On the other hand, the regulations will be much stricter than the uh, developed countries like Singapore, Australia, or Europe. Lastly, I, I would say that technology will not only be an enabler, but also be a differentiator. The, the space at which technology is trans, uh, transforming the world is unprecedented, right? So it's not just the consumer's mindset, but the access to information that they have and the way they make decisions, the entire pattern is changing and will continue to change. We will have to evolve as an industry and adapt as an industry. If you compare the crypto exchange platforms and client acquisitions that, that they make tend to be far more superior technologically advanced than the FX world. And uh, especially as a result, a recent example, if you, I'm sure that you're reading about the unprecedented customer acquisition rate of chat GPT, AI will continue to capture more mind share and market share across all sectors, including ours, right? Including the FX brokerage industry. This is definitely a space that will evolve and it will bet better itself to lead in the upcoming years. To conclude, the winners in this new age of FX trading will be those that adapt. Great. That's a great conclusion of, uh, of the session. We have a couple of minutes, well, roughly 10. Um, perhaps let's go to some of the questions we have received. Um, I think there is a question that um, I would like to ask you from our chat. Um, time to market is important when starting a brokerage but what do brokers skip when starting that comes back to bite? Which one of you would like to take on this one? Um, yeah, I can, I can go first. So um, certainly uh, kind of, as we mentioned, you see a lot of startup brokers uh, and they, you know, they want to get up and running quickly. They take the easier option of a, of a white label uh we get a lot of brokers coming to us that are white labels uh that have uh, established have a really big client base and they're completely locked into into their vendors the the brokers that that run the platforms for them and to move away it's uh it's pretty much impossible because you have to you'll have to move all your clients off your clients will have to have new platforms um and I, i'd say this really does come back to bite because uh, brokers can become very successful, have uh, sign up a lot of clients, have good flows, uh, have the resources to go out on their own and maximize uh, the profits from their flows, uh, but they just can't because they're, they're locked in. Gentlemen, others would like yeah, to add something? I, mean, I would just add to that, that I think, um, you know, people taking generic platforms as well, underestimate, you know, the support they get on those platforms. Um, so they, they don't sort of come as a fully managed service. You're, you're buying a license to a platform and you're supposed to look after them in-house. And that's the one that, you know, trying to get experts. I mean, you know, Thailand is a good example. There aren't a huge amount of Thai bro established Thai brokers of which you can go and get a, an MT4 specialist from. So where are you going to find that resource to then be able to manage um, your MetaTrader platform? I'm using them as an example, but it could be any other platform. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's an area where, which people tend to ignore. Maybe something to add uh, or let's just move to the next question. How do you feel? No, I, yeah, I, I think uh, John and uh, Chris have covered most of the points. We can give space for more questions instead. Uh, I think, yes, let's just uh, have our uh, next question, uh, which is very interesting. and. Um, FX industry is on the cusp of significant disruption as regulations and technology begin to lay the foundation for a fundamental shift in the business model. So the question is how to choose the best tech to stay on top of the competitions out there. Who, which one of you would like to start? <laughs> so uh, I think I'll start with that. Uh, um, we've repeated this a few times during the session today itself. Um, you would have to, you, in a, I mean, in the next five years, for sure, you would definitely require a vendor or a partner or tech that will allow you to scale to multiple assets, right? As you acquire more customers, you would have to provide them 
uh, made uh, different diversified offerings and asset types to service and not just asset types but value added services that will help you to retain the customers and uh, right now fx is a very dark area at times right where where it is more about uh, losing money but eventually in the next 5 years as the audience and the customer becomes more aware and educated your uh, the go to market strategy will change and uh, since you have such captive audience and captive customers that you have the margins that they will land up making offering other value added services and other asset types will be much larger and surpass the b book business that typically happens uh, so you would require in sort of vendor that will help you to expand and scale into multiple asset and services that you would provide in twin Chris, and then john to conclude all right um, yeah just very quick one on that i think whatever technology you opt for you need to make sure it can interact with other technology um if you are on a yeah. closed system um it yeah i'll give an example in eb's world in crm if you're on a system that includes its own crm and you don't like the crm you are stuck um, which is very much what John was implying with the white label solutions. Uh, I think, you know, whatever technology you go for, the more it can interact so that you can pick best of breed technology to work with um, and specialize in is, is the way forward. John? Uh, just one word, similar flexibility. So a platform that's flexible that can be plugged in, yep. others you can move. We don't know what's going to be happen happening in uh, six months' time, a year's time, five years' time. So something that's flexible. Yeah. Okay, just one last question. Again, if we can have just short, short answers. Um, would training, trading tools and analysis be seen as a way to differentiate in a crowded market? If so, which ones do you see having the best results for brokers? Perhaps, perhaps give just a couple of examples. Um, um, yeah, I can I can go first. So, so um, definitely 100% having um, an analysis and trading tools in in the platform. To Chris's point earlier, um, the, the future in, in of platforms is going to be having something that's that's uh, fully customized for the user. So we see this with uh, in you know in big tech when you're logging in, you're logging in something into something that's uh, that they've they've made made specific for you based on your preferences. So I think we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of stuff uh, where you know news feeds, watch lists, and things like that are, are based on your activity and 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 tailored to that. Uh, with regards to the actual the, the best ones, there are lots out there. It really does depend on on the on the brokers and um, what the needs are of the clients. Chris, got good API. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with John on that. I think uh, I think people want to have customizable front ends. Um, you know, a generic front end to appeal to a startup client who's never traded before and a professional trader, they're going to have completely different requirements. So being able to offer something which can be tailored, you, that either the broker can tailor for them, but preferably that the client can also go in and go, I want to look at it in this way and I want it to appear like this and I want to be, be able to look at different charts or be able to trade off the charts or whatever else. I think is is absolutely key going forward, and and certainly the the, the tech vendors I've worked with that provide these sort of solutions are um, in the last couple of months that's been very much the requirement. Yeah. Maybe actually I would like to give a uh, next question to you, uh, which is slightly different, and <laughs> just to spice okay. the thing up here. Um, sure. How do you think how to expand the client base? Because you also spoke earlier about the CRM, so perhaps that could be somehow related. Sure. Um, so what we've seen, and if you see some of the biggest brokers that that are there that exist in the world today, <clears throat> while the internal sales teams add a lot of value, uh, but I think and uh, not having an IB strategy in mix is definitely a recipe for disaster, right? You definitely have to have a very strong IB strategy, IB partnership. If you look at the bigger ones, they have some of them have five thousand, six thousand. We met up a, uh, met up with a broker who has almost sixty thousand IBs in their network. The way you would scale up your business, especially in the retail space, it's virtually impossible for you to uh, you know, go and address or reach out to every touch point that you're going to have to acquire clients. So IB has become a big network or a big uh, channel that you, will be, uh, you would acquire clients from. Chris, John? 
I mean, I, I would totally agree with EB. I think it does depend where you are geographically. Yeah. Um, EB is conveniently located in Singapore, and Asia in particular is massive with IBs. If you're going to offer a brokerage out of Asia, um, or there's going to be targeting Asia, and you, you're yeah. not set up for IB infrastructure, you're, you're, you're set up to fail. So I do mm. totally agree with EB on that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add on to Chris. It's not just Asia. I would say you look at any emerging market, Asia, Africa, yeah, LATAM. I'm sorry, yeah. Absolutely. Europe less so, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I do agree. I think LATAM as well, it's a big. Um, and we, we've yet to see it in Africa, but I'm, I'm sure it will start happening in Africa. Hmm. And the very, very, very last one, John, I will leave this one perhaps to you if you feel like answering it. Uh, the mechanisms of starting starting up a brokerage firm have highly been debriefed today. Unless do you think that there is enough setup protocol or go to diary which brokers have to have uh, have to have to smooth setup? Um, yeah, we see this a lot. So we see some brokers come and get set up extremely quickly. Some brokers take a very, very long time. Um, there's there's obviously no diary. Every broker is different. Every platform is uh, is different. I would say to to make sure you get up and running as quickly as possible, you should have the uh, the roles defined at your brokerage early on. So someone who's in in charge of tech, someone's in charge of the regulatory piece. And uh, if you're a startup, you can make really quick decisions. But if you don't know who's make, supposed to be making the decisions, or you're not communicating well. Um, this really does does slow things down. So yeah, be as organized as, as you can because you'd be surprised if the number of startups that um, sign up, they want everything next week. And then uh, a few months later, they're, they still haven't, uh, they're struggling with a logo or something like this and they haven't got this done. So but you need to, need to make decisions quickly. Thank you so much, John. I think we will conclude with this, unfortunately. I know this, is, this has been a great session. There are so many uh, more aspects and, and topics to discuss on this. We have many questions left. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. Uh, you can, however, uh, with all the questions that haven't been answered, you can reach out to our amazing speakers. Um, you see their contacts on the screen. Also, uh, this session has been recorded. You will have the chance to have it on demand or you will find it on our Finance Magnet YouTube channel. Uh, after the session, you will receive a follow-up um, email from our side, so do not worry. Um, other than that, I think we can finalize the session. My personal two favorite um, um, conclusions is Choose your battles and be flexible and uh, in, in any of the aspects uh, you're doing when starting your brokerage or when trying to expand. And um, I think this is it. Thank you so much uh, to our speakers. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And we hope to see you in, uh, in next sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Awesome. everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye.